The RAM is made up of four general sections. We have the text segment, which is where all the code goes that we're executing. Then we have the data segment, which is where all the constants go and global level variables. We have the heap, where all the objects go and instances, anything that we declare at runtime. And then we have the stack, which is a super fast area that functions use for calling and local variables. So let's take a look at the heap and how it works. And in our example here, we're going to say it's 32 KB wide, one big block of memory. Every block has a header. So the header of the block is going to say whether it's occupied or whether it's free and the size of it. Let's imagine that you've defined a class and you're going to create instances or objects of that class using something like the new keyword in a high level object oriented language. We could also allocate space in the heap directly using malloc and C. The object itself, the data is going to be on the heap. And in this example, I'm just going to say it's 1KB in size, but that will vary. Of course, the program is going to ask the heap allocator to give it 1KB. So it's going to go to this first block here because it's the only block that we have for this program. And it's going to see that there's 32 KB free. So instead of using the entire 32 KB, it's going to break it into a smaller section here. So it's going to break off 1 KB of the 32, leaving 31 KB untouched. And we're going to be able to have this buffer here for our file name. So the 1K is going to have its own header now. We're going to update to show that it's now 1 KB and that it's occupied, right? It's in use. And then the 31K, we're going to build it on its own header that says that there's 31K here that's free. Now let's say that we're going to create an object of a different class. Maybe this one is bigger, like 4KB. So if we want to allocate 4KB, what's going to happen is we're going to go back to the beginning of our heap in this example, and we're going to see that the first block is occupied. So then we're going to go to the next block. And then now we see that there's 31K available. And that, of course, will fit our 4KB that we want. So we're going to break off 4KB of the 31, leaving 27. And now we're going to have a header that says that it's, there's 4KB in use here. So we have now what we used to be 32K, is now being fragmented into a 1K allocation, a 4K allocation, and then 27K of free space. Now let's say we're going to instantiate a new object and take up four more kilobytes of space on the heap. So to allocate that, we're going to go back to the beginning here. We're going to see that this block of memory at this header is taken. So we're going to go to the next one. And we see that one is also taken. So then we go to the next one. And now we see that we have our 27K of free space. So we're going to break off four more of that and give it a new header. And this is now going to be 4K of space that we have available. The 27 now is 23K. We also add a new header for this updated space that is free. Now let's say there is a smaller object, only 1KB that we're going to allocate. We have the 20, what is it? 23K of free space here. So we break off 1KB of that right here and we add our metadata buffer. We update the tag, of course, to reflect that this 1K is now taken. And then our 23K is now 22K and we just, we add the new header for it to keep track. And now at this point, let's say that we're going to do one final allocation, maybe eight kilobytes, maybe it's a big buffer for something. So starting here, of course, we allocate 8k, leaving 14k as free. So we have 1k, 4k, 4k, 1k and 8k being allocated here in our heap. And if we went over, then we would just get more space from the OS. But in this case, let's just say that this is a pretend 32k space. Now let's imagine that we finish some operations. So we're able to free up some of the space. Let's say that data block B, we don't need anymore. So we free it or we delete it. We're going to update the header to show that it's now free. So we're going to have occupied, free, occupied, 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 and free. So now you can see the fragmentation starting to kind of show up. We have this free space just floating around here. So what's going to happen is once we free this block, we're actually going to check if the block next to it is free. In this case, it's not. This is still taken. Or if C, right, the one next to it on the right side is free. And this, in this case, it's also taken. So this guy is just going to stay by himself. Now, let's say the next line of code is to free this block here. What we're going to do is we're going to free this. We're going to update the header to show that it's free. And then it's going to check next door and say, hey, are you free? And he is free. So what's going to happen is we're actually going to join these together. We're going to merge them. Uh, we're going to coalesce these blocks of, of heap together. So now instead of being 4K and 4K, it's an 8K section. So we've tried to defragment it uh, at least slightly here to keep as much free space together as possible. So now we have 1K taken, 8K free, 1K taken, and 8K taken, and then uh, 14 free over here. So the heap itself has, I guess, 22K free, but it's fragmented. Now let's say we're going to instantiate an object that takes up 6 kilobytes on a heap. What we might do is go back to the beginning, check this header, and see that it's taken. Uh, the 1K is taken. So we move to the next one, and we see that there's 8K here of free space. So perfect. We can allocate 6K of it, leaving the other two free, and have our 6K here. So now what, what it will look like is we'll have 1K taken, 6K taken, 2K free, 1K taken, 8K taken. This is pretty much how the heap works. And there are different methods to traverse it. The one that we've been using is called first fit. 
And that just means that we go to the beginning and we keep checking every header to see where we have free space. And once we get free space, if it's big enough to hold what we want, then we allocate it there. Now you can see already that the problem with that is that we're going to traverse a lot uh, before we get to an actual spot that makes sense. So there are different kinds of, of fits. Um, another one is called next fit, where as we allocate, we keep track with a pointer of where we are in the heap so that when we're going to allocate something new, we don't need to start again from the beginning. We could just skip. Let's say at the end, we had this 14K free, right? So we could just keep a marker here to show that this is the last place we allocated from. And this will be the first place that we check and it's free. So it'll kind of help us save some cycles there. Another kind of fit is called the best fit. Let's say we have 16K of free space here, and then we have an uh, occupied 8K and then 8K free here. Let's say we wanted to store something that's like 4K. We would look at the 16K, but not use it yet, traverse through the 8K and then find the other 8K of free space and use the second 8K since it's gonna result in less space wasted. So that's the best fit. We're trying to find the smallest section of memory that can contain the data that we need. And then I think there's also worst fit and worst fit means that in this case, we would use a 16K to store the 8K with the idea that we want to leave as many large free spots available. There are different applications for each one, and I'm sure there's many others I don't know about. The operating system will have like really advanced optimization techniques to make this a lot smoother, but this is a general principle of how the heap works. And there is an alternative approach, which is called like a free list approach. And the idea is that if we have all of our blocks here, some occupied, some not, instead of traversing and perhaps going through a bunch of occupied blocks first, what we can actually do is just keep a list of the free areas and they all link together. So let's imagine that we had a similar setup as before. We had like 1K, 4K free, and then 4K taken and 1K free. And then let's say 8K taken and then the 14 free. So kind of like before. What we would actually have in this case, the free blocks would keep pointers to each other. And we'd have a list only of the free blocks and how much space they had. So in this sense, we would, it would actually be kind of like a next fit strategy where we're only talking to free blocks. And this is what I think most operating systems tend to use. We don't really care. The allocator does not care or keep track of the, of the occupied spots. So as soon as we want to allocate, we start only with free blocks. So we'll go to this block and then we'll go to the next one. So traversing doesn't go through occupied blocks. We'll start on a free block, traverse to another free blocks, and then to another free block. And it's, it's only the free blocks that we're keeping track. So in this case, if we did have this spot and this spot, let's say we ended up freeing this center one that was occupied with the free block system, we would add it to the list and then we would just update the pointers for our first free block and our second free block to put them in order. And then I guess we would coalesce this into a larger free block here. But the free list approach is much better, as you can imagine, because we're only looking at the free areas. We're not really concerning ourselves with the blocks that are occupied. And when it comes to the operating system itself, like the kernel uses slabs which are preset sizes so that we don't have this fragmentation that starts to form. And this is also kind of like what your garbage collector will do in a lot of the languages that have garbage collection. It will continually check to see like if you've used this variable or if any references exist. And once it's done, then on one of the garbage collection cycles, it will free it up. Sometimes the garbage collector will also rearrange and try to coalesce and move things around because as we have free gaps and fragmentation, it'd be great if you can put them together. But that, of course, takes CPU cycles and can be computationally expensive. So it's not always done. But this is generally how the heap works. We can see how much overhead there is with the heap, where we have to find the block that we want to use, break off the part that we need, update both headers, and then we can use the space. So that's many cycles that are kind of committed to, to that process. And when we're, when we're deallocating space, we have to update the header, check the neighbors, and perhaps merge it all on the thread of your program, at least in the conventional sense. With modern systems, um, there's a lot of optimizations, but this is a general, general spirit of the heap. So it's a lot of homework to do. If we compare that to the stack, then we can see that the stack, let's say that in the same program, we had the actual function to write the data to the disk. And maybe that has like a 1KB buffer. So all we do when we want to allocate on the stack is we just move the pointer, the stack pointer upwards. It's one operation. Instead of going in and searching for the block, updating headers, and then writing the data, we just move a pointer up and then we can use a space. And if we have 64 bytes, let's say for a counter, like a eight, eight byte counter, we're just moving the pointer up and down, uh, making this incredibly rapid. So this is why the stack is a lot faster. Now you might say, well, for allocation, it's faster because you're moving it up and down versus traversing. But when we're retrieving data, these are both part of the same RAM. So if we're going to resolve an address, then we're going to have to resolve an address in the stack too. 
So it should be the same speed. And that would be the case except for the CPU cache. So if we imagine this is now the CPU and we have a small cache here called L1 and then a larger cache here called L2 and then the biggest one, let's say out of these three, the L3, then these caches here, the CPU is trying to predict what data we're gonna need so that it can store it here instead of going out to the RAM or like to the stack or the heap, you know, the, the RAM over here. He's constantly trying to figure out what data are we gonna need. Now, if we look at the stack here, and if we look at a sort of, let's say a sample of a heap up here, then the stack inherently is a last in first out. So that means that whatever is at the top, let's say that we had more items here, then whatever is at the top, we're gonna need that. And we have the call stack here in the order of how we used it. So it's very easy for the CPU to sort of just circle this top area and say, well, this is what's gonna be in use. So you can cache it here uh, versus a heap. If we have like data here and then a gap and then data here and a gap, it's very hard to tell what are we gonna need? So it's very hard for the CPU to cache this. So every time that we look for something and it's in the cache and the CPU is able to find it, that's called a cache hit. So there's a lot more cache hits with the stack. If it looks for something in the cache and doesn't find it, then that's called a cache miss. And that generally happens more with the heap. So this is why the stack, even though it's the same memory, it's much faster to retrieve from the stack usually because it's much easier for the CPU to add it to the cache. And the caches themselves, the L1, L2, L3, and sometimes there's more, they're just, uh, really, really fast pieces of like RAM itself that are inside the CPU. And we're kind of getting with modern systems to having the actual RAM within the CPU to make it even faster. But the idea is that they're not as fast as registers, but they're incredibly fast, faster than the RAM. And whenever you can store stuff in the cache, it just speeds everything up where we don't need to wait for these memory cycles and um, can keep things within the CPU itself. So L1 is the closest one sort of to like the registers. Uh, it's the fastest one, but the smallest one. L2 is larger than L1, but slower. And L3 is slower than the other two, but the biggest one out of these three, uh, if we're dealing with only these three. So that's how, that's why the stack is not only faster in allocating, but also in retrieval, because it's much easier to cache. It's more cache friendly, we could say, uh, just by its, the nature of it, it's very organized. And we can see why the stack is called a stack. It's just a very pretty stack of, of items going in order of how we need it. And the heap is just kind of like thrown together into a heap, which is why it kind of has that name. So I hope this helps to demonstrate how this works. It'd be great if we could use a stack all the time, but of course these go away uh, through function calls. So they're only useful for momentary data within a function, whereas the heap is available throughout the lifetime of the program. And it's a lot larger space, whereas a stack is usually limited to smaller space. So I hope this helps to, uh, to understand the heap. And in the future, what we'll do is we'll talk about the virtualization that the operating system does and how this memory is actually stored on the physical memory, because Many times it's not actually stored in this contiguous fashion. When we go into operating systems, which should be soon, we can talk about how that virtualization happens. So I hope this helps.